Hey, how's it going, everybody? I'm Ben from Universal Audio, and welcome back to another Monday Luna Office Hours. Hope you guys all had a wonderful weekend, uh, and we've got a fun show uh, kind of lined up for you guys today. We're going to be doing a big deep dive into groups and buses. Uh, I've already seen a lot of great questions coming through uh, here inside the chat, asking about you know going from like mono to stereo. Um, and you know, obviously, lots of lots of other amazing questions kind of coming through. Um, it, it, good to see that you guys. I, I love this comment from Zach. I got a shout out. Watching these intros is like watching an intro to a sports game, except he knows that his team isn't going to lose, and that's totally right, Zach. I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, but you know, just like uh, just like sports, this is not a solo effort. This is a team effort. And today we got Matt and Drew with us. How you guys doing? Good. How, yeah, you, doing, how you doing, Ben? Doing well. Doing well. Oh, you guys are almost in sync. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> One, two, three. Yeah, working on it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, on, there we go. on our timing. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Well, uh, guys, so this is going to be a fun show. we got a lot of stuff to, to, to show people today. But uh, before we jump into it, just want to make sure everyone's aware there's a couple of really good promotions going on. Number one, if you buy a Apollo Twin, Apollo Solo, there's a desktop platinum vocal promo where you get a ton of free plugins along with a new desktop audio interface. Uh, so if you haven't checked that one out, make sure you, you do, because I think there's like Auto-Tune, uh, what else is in there? There's like uh, Oxide, a bunch of uh, a bunch of amazing UAD plugins that you get along with your interface, and that's both for Helios new... Helios, too. Oh, yeah, Helios. Yeah, Helios is in there. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's a real good one. Uh, if, you're already, if you're already on the UAD, UAD platform, though, there's, I'm sure you guys are getting the emails. I got one this morning for uh, the custom shop is open, so you can get awesome deals on custom bundles as well as UAD and Luna plugins. Uh, so don't miss that one. And I'm sure you guys are seeing this across all social media. We talked about it a little bit at the beginning of last week's show, but the UA FX pedals are now shipping. So folks who had pre-ordered the pedals are now starting to receive them. We're seeing it all over social media. People posting up uh, clips of them with the pedals. Uh, so it's really cool to hear what you guys are doing with the pedals. Uh, and as we talked about last week, the we put up some new videos for each pedal. So now each pedal, there's a video with just sound examples where it's nothing but... Uh, nothing but sounds coming in through the pedals, and it's very focused on a per effect. So if you're kind of curious about, you know, what does the precision delay sound like, or what does the chamber and hall actually sound like, we've got examples that clearly uh, outline what each one of those sounds like. Um, and that's up on our YouTube channel, which hopefully you guys are all subscribed to. You know, see so many familiar names. I know all of you guys are subscribed, but if you haven't already, subscribe. Uh, make sure you, make sure that way you get you don't miss out on any of these shows or new videos as we put them out. Uh, and yeah, I think, uh, there was one question that's not on today's topic that I thought would be good to hit real quick, which was, uh, and this is a good one. I want to, you know, also hear from you guys in the audience. Uh, I think it was, it was maybe Zach that was asking that as well, or, uh, Tricky, uh, was asking about, uh, monitoring health and listening health and hearing, uh, and if, if we had any, uh, you know, any best practices or advice to offer. Um, and I'll, number one for me, the, you know, the thing I learned 85 dB is like a really comfortable zone to monitor at for extended periods. Um, it's actually, well, first it's, of all, get a DB meter, right? Step one, step one, no. step one. <laughs> yep. Uh, they make them for your phone. You know, the, the classic was the radio shack SPL meter RIP. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, nowadays you can get a phone app. They're not, you know, they're not, you don't want to take scientific measurements using those apps, but they're good enough. They're good enough to guesstimate generally what your uh, what your levels at. And of course, Drew's got the the Radio Shack <laughs> I model. Got the, uh, the super old school. Yeah. Super oh, that's not super. That's one. that's medium old school. The super old school. Medium is the old one school. With, this is the one with the actual VU meter in it. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. So it's not quite that old. Yeah. So learning learning what eighty five sounds like. 
number one tip right there. Personally, for me, I like to vary my levels a lot. So for me, what's really important when you're mixing is that you know what it sounds like when it's really quiet and when it's coming out of a small speaker at like a low volume. You want to make sure it, because to me, the balance has changed a lot between when I'm blasting it, when it's super quiet, when I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, so especially that first pass of mixing for me, I'm always varying my levels. I'm going up and down. I want to check it. You know, does it sound badass when I blast it? You know, is it, is it really sound cool? I'll do that for like 30 seconds or a minute and then turn it all the way down. Does it still have that same energy, that same feel? Um, so as far as, you know, I'm no doctor, but you know, changing your levels, making sure they had a reasonable amount, um, and then, you know, vary it from there. Um, and I short mean, periods of time, like you're saying, if you're going to do loud, do it just, you know, do it for short periods of time. Don't, not for extended periods of time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah. Any, uh, any other suggestions that you guys have? I guess, you know, a lot of people work on headphones. Headphones, I think it's kind of hard to measure the SPL inside of headphones. Yeah. You got to use your judgment, right? Like if, if you can't like, and I fall into this all the time, especially if it's later at night, you know, you'll just kind of, you're like enjoying it. You kind of, le- you're leaving it louder and louder and louder. Uh, and before you know it, you take off your headphones. You're like, "Whoa, that was that was far too loud." <laughs> well, that's the yeah, thing. That's is, why it's if good you to ever take think, too. Yeah. yeah, and if you ever feel like if you ever feel like your hearing is sort of when you come out of a loud situation, if you ever feel like your hearing is sort of a, like that's the, your body kicking in and protect trying to you know protect itself. Mm-hmm. So never expose yourself to a situation where you know we've all come out of a concert or a show or something, and your hearing feels sort of somewhat suppressed it's like that's that's a sure sign that you've done you're, you've done damage you've done it you've exposed yourself to a scenario that could cause damage if it was extended so yep. stay out of those situations i guess yeah it was like if you're at concerts if you're in a loud place um wear earplugs you know one of the <clears> best investments that you can make to protect your hearing uh is you know in the studio you typically have control over your level so you know you're in control of what's going on there when you're out in the world when you're you know subway trains stations airports concerts gun ranges any like wear earplugs <laughs> wear as good at earplugs as you can afford um but the, for me the best investment i ever made was getting those molded ones that you you could get the specific filter so you could get like 15 db filters that bring down the level just enough but they left the the overall tonality of stuff much more even um as well as they fit perfectly into my ear and they came with a nice little carrying case so like i was able to oh, nice anytime i knew i was maybe you know going to a concert or to a bar or to you know to some event remember remember those days where we did those things guys it was it <laughs> yeah. was like years ago uh a decade ago i know uh <laughs> i would always be prepared i'd always have those and i'd, I'd you know i'd leave guitar picks in there as well so i was you know kind of had like my little little case of I'm um, about to be in a loud situation, <laughs> which is either going to require earplugs or guitar picks. One of the two. Um, <laughs> Smart move. Yeah. But uh, yeah, going for... Uh... Oh, Glenn's asking if we can tell his wife that mixing on headphones is bad for his ear health. It's awful. He <laughs> really, you know, it's it's the number one way to, to lose, uh, to, you know, to not get great mixes is to just do headphones, right? Uh, whatever you... What, just tell her we approve... Glenn, get some get some speakers. Leave them on low though. Keep her happy. Keep everybody happy. Leave them on kind of a low volume. You don't need to be blasting everybody. Uh, yeah, taking breaks. Everyone, I'm seeing a lot of people here in uh, in the chat saying having breaks. Oh, uh, Jeremy has a having set 86 dB levels. Not always mixing that loud, but referencing it so he has consistency. And that's why the 85. Um, if you guys want to dive deeper into this, check out the Fletcher Munson curve. And that's part of the reason why 85 is kind of the sweet spot is it's one of the most, our ears are dynamic in how they hear highs and lows in relation to volume. Check out, it's on, you know, I think even just reading the Wikipedia part, article about Fletcher Munson, you guys will get uh, familiar really fast with uh, what's what's going on there and why 85 is ideal. Um, and there is, there's this slightly known feature, I don't know, Drew, if you've ever messed around with this, but if you're using your Apollo to control your monitors, you know, typically it's like zero dB all the way when it's full, fully lit up. You can actually mm-hmm. calibrate that to be a SPL, a dB SPL. Uh, so right. if you do have an SPL meter, you can calibrate your monitor control in your Apollo mm-hmm. to read an SPL. Um, and of course, this is all program dependent. So you know, even if you have it set to eighty five, you may get spikes that are above that or below it. But um, there is a way to to calibrate your monitors so if you're using the Apollo like that. And that's in the manual. It might be in the surround section, but the mm-hmm. the way to do that. In fact, we on our site, we you can download the file you need, uh, the the pink noise or white noise. I can't remember what is it, Matt. You I think you remember what that is? But I think you yeah, can download the file, file from our site. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And then there's instructions in the manual for anybody that wants to do it. So nice. Uh, man, last week's show, we we did a, a, a preview show and then the, the update launch, and uh, we've been seeing nothing but rave reviews about the templates. Uh, so uh, love, you know, if you guys are here in the chat, we'd love to uh, love to know what some of your templates are that uh, you guys have been making over the last week. If uh, you know, Obviously, we showed a bunch of different uh, ways to create them and use them in our show last week, uh, but I'd be curious to know if you guys have uh, come up with some uh, clever, unique ideas for using templates. Uh, Bo's asking, where do we find that file? Uh, Drew, do you uh, just Google yeah, let me, for... Let me, let me see if I can find it, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, does anyone else think that 85 is pretty loud? 85 is kind of loud. It, you're right, Metropolis. Like that 85 is not the quietest setting, uh, but it is, it, it, for a lot of people You know, in the studio sometimes, I've been in plenty of studio situations where they want it at 100, and I want to walk out of the room when they want it at a, when the clients want it at 100. <laughs> So I found uh, that uh, I found oh, it. Nice. And put it in the chat. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so over over on our YouTube chat, guys, the uh, the help article for setting up surround sound, and I'll walk you through that calibration process. Uh, you know, and also like, it's about surround sound, but also will work in a stereo situation as well. Yep. Uh, starting to build, build templates to mirror the hardware in different classic studios. Oh, that's cool. That's really cool, Daniel. Nice. Um, they won. Nice. Well. Uh, so guys, I guess you know, uh, keep on hitting us up with questions. But today we wanted to focus on talking about like setting up your sessions and most importantly making use of groups and buses. Uh, we've seen you know we've seen plenty of messages and in, in chat and also over on the forums and across social media uh, asking you know when should I be using buses? How do I set up buses? What's the difference between a bus and a group? Um, and these are two very powerful features. You know, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're bringing things together to be able to control the amount of level of multiple tracks. Uh, but there's multiple ways, you know, there, like any good uh, road trip here, there's multiple ways to get to the destination you're looking to get to. Uh, so it's important that you kind of, you know, all the different routes and know when to pick one over the other, whether it's using the output send, uh, a, you know, an aux send, a group. Spill feet. There's so much cool stuff that uh, that we're going to talk about here. Um, so I guess to start off, like let's 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 define what a group is and what a bus is. Uh, so Drew, how, how, in your mind, how do you how do you explain this to people? How do you how do you get the concept of like groups and buses inside of Luna? Yeah. So the one thing I think if you if you just sort of append a word to the front of groups and call them control groups, like that's mm -hmm. kind of because that's what their function is. Their function is to group controls. So so, you know, Luna's groups it, that you find in the lower left hand corner. These are uh, these are ways of linking parameters, linking uh, uh adjustments that you can make so that you can do them all at one time whereas buses always involve rerouting of audio so if you just think about it in those two terms groups are all about control buses are all about routing uh, for various uh, functions so that's kind of the at the highest level you can just break it down into that into those two subcategories to begin with yeah so buses um, are going to be they're going to be passing signal through them so that's exactly. great for a great you know for if you want to share processing between tracks if you want them all to have the same compressor same eq or same reverb and you want to share that effect between multiple tracks you're going to want a bus that's yep. the easiest way if you want to control the the fader or the amount of level being sent to something for you know three or four you know or however many tracks that's a group so you, yeah. perfect way to put it, Drew, like controls are groups, processing is buses. Uh, yeah. And everybody in chat, if, if we're ever moving too fast or if anything's unclear, holler, let it, let us know. We're, we're here to show you guys how this goes. Uh, so, but bus tracks can get confusing, right, Drew? Because <laughs> we talk about them with so many different, there's a lot of synonyms out there, guys. This is going to be, and so we're going to try to, we're going to do our best to hold, hold tight to the right words. But what are some of the other words that people kind of associate with buses? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess auxes, you know, auxes mm -hmm. are short for auxiliaries. Um, some people just use the word bus to mean like a, a, a bus or a master uh, bus of a, a group of tracks, you know, that, you, yep. that you've then routed to. Um, or subgroup. Yeah, uh, yeah subgroup. Send and sub return. In fact, yeah, I happen to use the, uh, I happen to, in, and in my demo, you'll see that uh, I tend to try and keep things pretty regimented. And for me, I would just use the shorthand of sub, right? So mm -hmm. if, if, in other words, if a bus track is being used as an effect, I'll call it, I'll, I'll call it, I'll name it the effect. But if this bus track is being used as a subgroup, then 
I'll call it, for example, drum sub or percussion, perk sub, you know, or bass sub. So mm -hmm. that's kind of my distinction because in, in Luna's browser, when you click on a send or you click on an output, they're all grouped together, right? So if you're not, if you're not like, if you don't have a system in place, then it can be confusing. Okay, well, is that, is that a parallel process that I've set up or is that a, a send and return effect, a time-based effect, mm -hmm. or is that a subgroup? So I've kind of uh, kept that and that combined with color coding. Um, if you develop a system, you can super, stay super organized and, 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 uh, not get confused, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, you know, some people end up calling these like STEM group, you know, and especially if you're coming from other DAW, there's some other DAWs, right? Where, uh, Matt, you're familiar with this, like in Ableton, right? A group is kind of a bus in a sense, right? You group some tracks together yeah. in Ableton live. They now become a bus that that's processing all, all the same, not really sharing controls. Correct. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And they also get foldered into like a, a bus folder pretty much where you can collapse it and expand it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, definitely different DAWs kind of treat the word bus as different things. Yeah. So yeah, this is where it's just, again, let's go back to Drew's original distinction. Groups are for control. And we're talking specifically about Luna here and we'll, we'll, we'll jump into a bunch of demonstrations for you guys here in a second. Control Controls, you know, moving faders, moving pan pots, moving things together. That's a group processing things together mm -hmm. whether it's a, a reverb you know send return or a, a, a you know a drum subgroup where you want to process those together shared processing is a bus uh, and sometimes you know a bunch of us who come from uh, from the pro tools world will call it an aux because uh, we get so used to aux tracks from uh, from working in that working in pro yeah. tools for so many years um, and then all right so let's I guess let's, let's start diving in. Let's start showing people how to create these things, how to make the best use out of them. Uh, so Drew, let me share your screen and, and let you kind of, and there's also, uh, this is all to say guys, there's also some really cool advanced features about using uh, buses and, and groups inside of Luna that, that we'll show you guys here as well. Yeah, so just to get us started, let's let, let me just reiterate what we just said, you know, when we were just talking about, you know, down here in the bottom left hand corner, we can see, you know, our the, the groups here. And, you know, I've got in this particular session, I've got a bunch of them, drums, congas, percussion, bass, choir, etc. Um, as far as the, what the groups can control, you'll, you know, when you set them up, you can choose this. But if you if you want at any point to change this, if I right click on it, you can see here in this popover. Uh, first of all, I can edit the group. So if you want to edit the name or if you want to add or subtract tracks, uh, I could delete the group, of course, which is, uh, uh, you know, undoable, which is nice. And then down here are the settings, right? So uh, basically what you're picking here is uh, mixing settings, which are basically your volumes and pans and so forth. And then, of course, editing, meaning the timeline. So they'll ed be edited together there. You can also um, you can also uh, uh, check the inserts so that let's say you have the exact same EQ on the same group of tracks and you want to you know adjust them all at the same time you can do that I don't do that very often so and that's off by default and then you can do sends which is actually off by default as well but I have it turned on here which uh, which enables you to come over here and uh, to adjust for example uh, all of these sends together um, mm -hmm. and if that you know if that were not checked then these guys would be uh, adjusted separately and so forth. Nice. So down yeah. here, you've got your your groups there in that group pane. Nice. And uh, the sends one, does that also affect the, the cues? Uh, or is that just in the mixing one that affects cues? Yeah, you know, I, I believe it is. I believe it does. Let's see. Let's find out. I don't, uh, let's see. Uh, it does, yeah. So cues are considered sends. It's mm -hmm. not often I'm doing that, but uh, yeah. Yeah, that they, it does work for that, for that as well. Yeah. And so, uh, so how do you create groups? Uh, you know, I was, you've got a session here kind of already preset with some in there, but for folks who are, you know, getting their session organized, what's, what's kind of your workflow for group, getting stuff grouped together like that? Yeah, for me, for me, it's always, you know, the command G, right? So you select mm -hmm. your groups. If I select my, well, these are already, are already selected, but let's pretend I didn't. And then I just do command G brings up the group pane mm -hmm. and here you can, here's where you can name it and and where you pick the attributes and also you can you have the tracks that you've selected when you do it nice. um you also have a cool you also have the ability which is cool is to i can just drag and drop so if this if i want this to be in a group i can simply come over here and drag it in and it gets oh, nice. added to that group yeah so it's a drag and drop uh that's great if you've made a group and then you've added a track later and you just want to pop it into the group you can do that a little drag and drop into that pane Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have the plus sign. You have the plus sign here, so if you, which will bring up that uh, uh, the the naming browser as well, which kind of duplicates. Um, so that's the plus sign is essentially like as if you press Command G. Uh, yeah, the exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
Uh, so the yeah, drag, the drag and drop wanna... one is is that, that's one of my favorite ones is is being able to drag yeah. them over and, and drop them in. Uh, but one of the other one of the other really big things, at least I find myself always in this, is you know sometimes I want to be working in a group, but then let's say you know, you've got your drum group going there, Drew. What happens if you want to just work on the kick for a second? Like you know, you just really quickly want to get in there, make a change, and not have it affect the other tracks. How do you typically do that? Yeah, so I mean, if it's just a real quick level adjustment, I can just hold down control, and that will clutch that particular control out of the grouping behavior. So that's one option. Command mm -hmm. Shift G. Command yep. Shift G is, you know, one of it's one of those it's one of those claw ones, right? You, you know, yeah, it's one of those G. ones that you just <laughs> let, you, your hand is constantly formed in Command, you know, that. that I know form. I can do that one. I can do that one like in my sleep. Command Shift uh -huh. G, uh, which is the same, of course, as coming over here and turning this off. And then you also have the option of simply coming over here and, and deselecting a given group. So you got several options here. Nice. Um, by the way, over here, you also have this dot. And just for full, you know, to, to finish out over here, you have these dots, which allow you to uh, show and hide tracks. So if I click this dot, it'll show and hide those members of the group. If I command click on it, it'll show only those, uh. Uh, which is which is super handy. So that's a good way of navigating your session. It also spills, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about in this episode as well. Uh, nice. Another good way of, of being able to see tracks and work with tracks. Awesome. So those are groups, right? So yeah, so that's, that's uh, you know, let's see if there's any follow-up questions in the chat, but that's, I mean, I guess our focus was a little bit more on buses, but, but mm -hmm. you know, happy to go over any group stuff as we see. Yeah, so, so now far. buses. Yeah, so far so good? Yep. Yep. Yeah, so let's uh, so let's take a look at buses because th this is this this action happens in the in the uh, mixer itself, and, and you'll notice in this particular case, I actually have three three tracks, uh, three bus tracks, all side by side, each mm -hmm. of them doing something different, right? So that that's one of the key f features, the key things you want to remember about bus tracks is they have different usages. So usage number one would be. Uh, a bus track. This one is named Drum Reverb, and I have capital chambers on it. And so this, the entire function of this bus track is to uh, have a an auxiliary or an effects send and return configuration, a classic routing configuration that has you know been done on consoles for many many decades. And the concept here is that is that it allows you to tap into your the signal of your source tracks, and with varying controls on each. If you don't want to have them linked, you can disable the group and adjust that. And so what these guys do is these create, these send a, a percentage of this signal based on the amount of the, uh, uh, based on the amount of the knob, by the way, if you want to see it as a fader instead, if you prefer faders, you can hit the uh, expand uh, box in the middle, gives you the full fader. It's also where you get access to the pan knobs for your sends. Mm -hmm. And so the idea here is I'm simply sending a, a specific amount of each particular drum track into capital chambers. And it's functioning, it's doing that job as an effects, a uh, send and return effects thing. To the right of that, we have uh, another usage of a bus track, which is for parallel processing. In this case, it's, a, it's a, uh, an 1176 that I have in all buttons mode, right? And, you know, spanking, in this case, I only want to do it to the kick and the snare. Nice. So having it on sends, having it on sends is perfect because, uh, and this is actually my preference. I know you could put it on the group and you could use the mix knob, but my preference is to keep it on a send for this exact reason right here. And that is that I want to be able to only uh, do it and have control of the amount, right? So mm -hmm. if, if I am, if I want to hit the kick or the snare, let's say harder than the, than the kick into the parallel bus, then having it on a send works great. Yeah. Um, so that's what this bus track is for. And then lastly, the third bus track to, uh, here is, and you'll notice the naming that I, you know, in this case that uh, I've got them named uh, drum sub. So this is my way, this is my way of, you know, drum verb, parallel and drum sub. And that's my shorthand for sub mix. And, and, and in this case, this is different in the sense that this aux, this, this bus track um, is receiving its signal from the output of these tracks as opposed to sends. Mm -hmm. So that's the big, you know, the, the sends are for parallel processing and for time-based effects. The outputs are for when you're creating a sub mix. Yeah. And in this case, um, I'm just creating a standard drum subgroup to be able to process them. In this case, add Neve summing. And you'll notice in my particular workflow, what, what I enjoy doing is I enjoy having everything sort of separated and segmented into its own thing. So all everything about my drums, including any parallel process and any time-based effects, all feed into this drum sub, which then and uh, feeds the main mix after that. So nice. those are the three basic use cases, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, and so the, it's really important, guys, to, to know that the 
Uh, so primarily when we're talking about buses, the two places that buses come, uh, are, can be routed to or from is the sends area and the output of a track. Those are the two. Uh, and that's also how you, how you can create these. Uh, so we had a question here in the chat asking like, how do you create a, how do you assign or create a reverb bus? Um, so you mind walking us through like how you yeah, know, you've got this sure. one pretty set up here. So like, how would you say on like the percussion track? Let's say you wanted to make uh, a, a little bit of a room reverb around your percussion sources. Can you walk people through? Because yeah. uh, there's yet again, there's there's not just one way to do this. There's, there's multiple <laughs> yeah. multiple ways to accomplish it. Uh, and there's there's a keyboard shortcut way. There's a clicking way. Um, so yeah. do you, what, let's let's walk through your preferred way, and then we'll show people the the other way as well. Yeah, my preferred way, and what I what I'm just used to, muscle memory being what it is, is uh, is first of all, like you know, I'll select the tracks first, uh, which in this case, if they're part of a group, they'll when I select one, they'll select all, and then I like to use the shortcut, so the keyboard shortcut, so Command Shift B, right? So Command Shift B mm -hmm. brings up our Create Bus tab. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a name. Always uh, name means, it, guys. Never, yeah. It, Don't leave them unnamed. It's yeah. It's <laughs> not a mystery, right? We don't want any mystery here, right? We That's just why want the, exactly the cursor is placed is. there. It's made. It's made to be very quick and easy to rename your buses. And it, you know, all joking aside, it just helps. As you guys will notice in Drew's session, everything's color coordinated. It's organized. It makes it so when you open up your session again after maybe you know a month or two and not looking at it to make a recall you can just instantly know you have the lay of the land because you use some consistent naming some consistent color usage um, yeah for and, sure yeah just don't leave you know it's tempting to just move fast and just leave it bust <laughs> and what it, you know don't do it guys take the two yeah. seconds it takes to name it well, and I, you know, me, I'm a little bit, little bit, you know, I, I kind of take, maybe take it to an extreme because you'll notice, look, I specifically, I'm going to call this perk verb because this is a, ver a reverb that's specific to the percussion. Mm -hmm. uh, in, and when I'm in this window, here's where, here's some keyboard shortcuts that will be super useful to you. So we're going to use the up and down arrows, the side, the, the side to side arrows along with command and, and option. So first one is command up and down. So command up and down allows me to create the it, it's 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 labeled route from selected so this is why i select the tracks first so mm -hmm. that whatever i do here will apply to the selected tracks now the default is output that's good if you're going to make a submix but that's not what we're doing we're doing a time-based effect so i'm going to hold down command and hit the down arrow and here's where i can choose which of the eight sends or of course i can also do none um and I'm going to do send one because this is the first effect that I'm putting onto the percussion. And it's this specific perk verb. So I'm going to do that. Now, command in the left and right arrow is how you choose the format. In this case, mono or stereo. I personally always make stereo uh, buses for effects because most algorithms or many algorithms are true stereo in, stereo out. And really, there's no downside to not making it stereo when it comes to time-based effects. So I always recommend that you do that. If I When I move over to the option key, option up and down is where I can uh, toggle through the summing, console summing. It defaults to Neve, but you can move it to API or you can have it on none. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that dialog box. And so then once I hit that, once I hit create, you'll notice what Luna does. First of all, Luna will create the 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 bus track and assign it to the tracks up here now i personally you know luna defaults to green buses green colored buses that's its default color code and i use that for my sub mixes but i like i like my effects to be um dedicated to the colors of the tracks right so um I'll, I'll probably not find the, the right color for that one in, 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 in short order, but, um, wherever there's a, there's so a I quick, uh, you know, what, let's talk colors for a second. So select the, select the two tracks, that one and the one next to it. So if you, uh -huh. if you ever in the, find you guys in the same situation, notice now in the color wheel, ah, the, the two me. colors that you have, it shows them selected. So you can actually, you, you could see the pink color got highlighted and it would make it easy to find your color. So I do this all the time. Nice. Right? Yeah. I'll take a, oh, I want this track to join that track. I'll, I'll select both of them, open up the color, see, we, color wheel and you find it. I just it. been. Yeah, I just been fumbling around in there, so that's a that's a good tip. Thank you, Ben. Um, Great tip. So, but you'll notice I do I I like I let the green ones the green ones I let Luna mm -hmm. make the subs leave the subs green and then I color code the rest of it there. 
Well, because um, it's super helpful. It notice guys that notice his sends and notice the output buses like in the mixer window. They 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 carry that color coding through, so you can easily mm -hmm. see like right now, Drew. I'm sure you're being about like exactly right here. The output of that perk verb, you can see it's gray. It's not green. That means it's going yeah. out to your main your main mix, your final fader, uh, which in this case is something that you're going to want to change the assignment of to go to your perk sub. Correct. Yeah, and that's why, yeah, exactly. And so now you can see why. You can see why I'm I'm vigilant about uh, naming. If something's a sub, I name it, I just name it perk sub, base sub. And if it's a, an effect, I name it, the, you know, where, who's it for and what the effect is. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of unique to me, the whole idea of this separation of effects for specific things. But, and I can, I can, we can talk later about why that's, why that's important for me. But, um, but yeah, so I've now created that. Well, of course I have to actually make it a reverb, right? What verb should I use, right? Uh, How about the... Let's use the 250. Yeah. This guy. Perfect. This guy's great. Love this reverb. Um, great drum and drum reverb. Um, so yeah, so that that's that's my preferred method. Uh, using the keyboard shortcut to bring up the bus assign bus creation tab, and then using those other shortcuts to kind of assemble it the way I want. And then yeah, color code it and get the thing on it as needed. And, and I like to get it out of into that same sub. So what do you, I don't know, what are you guys doing? What are you, uh, you got a different method, Ben? Yeah, uh, actually, Matt, can I share your screen and have you have you walk people through the other method of uh, making the buses? Yeah, for sure. Nice. Cool. cool. So yeah, I mean, uh, definitely Command Shift B. That's the recommended way. That's the way I like doing it too. But sometimes uh, you kind of get ahead of yourself, and Luna has ways to route you back to the right place. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say I, I have all my tracks selected, and I want to create a submix, um, but I. Let's say I don't create the bus yet. I go straight to the output menu where you, where you can route the output of the tracks to the submix uh, bus, but I don't have the the submix bus created yet. In this uh, focus browser panel that pops up, there's this little plus sign in the top right corner. I can click that, and uh, when I'm in this mode, it automatically defaults to bus. Then uh, I can basically give it a name, use the keyboard shortcuts that Drew was showing us, option up and down to select summing. Um, command left and right to select if it's mono or stereo. I'll leave the stereo and I'll leave summing off. Um, then I can click OK. And it creates the, the drum bus the same way that uh, Drew was creating it, but without having to go through the Command Shift B uh, menu. It's just all directly from the focus browser here where you route the tracks. Nice. Uh, and we got a good question here from Tricky asking Is there a limit to the number of buses that you can have uh, in Luna? Um, no, yeah, there's no limit to the number of buses. Um, you are limited to eight sends on each track, but you can actually um, have as many buses as you wanted created. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, what is important, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later in the show, uh, the, where there is a limit around buses is around the ARM mode, uh, so the advanced real-time monitoring that's built into Luna. Yeah. Uh, and we'll touch on that a little bit later. We've done we've done some deep dives about ARM before, uh, but just know that you know you can have two buses enabled in ARM mode, uh, and we'll talk about what you're going to use those for and why uh, a little bit later here in the show. Uh, but yeah, so from an output, is, and you guys are noticing like when Matt's selecting these multiple tracks and hitting the output, notice how all the names, all those those labels were kind of like a light blue it really helps you kind of see at a glance like oh what's about to be affected so matt can you do the same thing and try you know let's let's do the the click way of doing it through a sense so now if you want to make a drum reverb from these tracks again select the tracks you want to do it to you know is a it's a nice head start for yourself of like all right these are the tracks i want to start with and then and then all you have to do is hit the plus button right yeah, exactly. So I'll click the plus button on the send row that I want to assign from. In this case, it's just send one. Um, I already have all the tracks selected. <clears throat> and I'll do the same thing I just did before. I'll create, uh, click the plus sign up here, so name this drum verb, um, leave it stereo, and hit OK. And then it's automatically going to create a send in all of those tracks that I had selected that gets routed to that drum verb that I just created here. Nice. Monty, um, by the way, Monty's watching along with us at home, and he, he literally called this out right before you did it, Matt. <laughs> he was just like, oh, by uh, the way, you can use this for a sense, too. Uh, read my so mind. We're, we're all, all in the same wavelength over here on this team. Um, so that's, and so and again, you can also do this after the fact, right? So, like, you don't, we're showing you how to create buses and route them all at the same time. But, of course, you can also, if you already have, you know, say you have your plate reverb uh, send already set up, um, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, you can hit the plus button and send it into that. So yeah, so Matt just removed, removed all those, uh, verb sends. So now when he hits the plus, um, it, that drum verb bus is still active in the session until you delete that bus. 
Uh, but now you exactly. can select all of them, hit the plus button, and then on that left side, just assign it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, seeing a comment here from Forrest saying, you know, he uses Command Shift N all the time. So what? Uh, which this uh, Forrest, love you. It, great work. That's probably the longest way to create a bus. Uh, so what, <laughs> so what he's doing is he's it, Command Shift N. That's create a new track. So this you can make you know you can make audio tracks. You can make instrument tracks. The third one that's in there is you can make a bus track using the create new tracks and you can name it you can do all the same settings so you and this is uh this is the way we all i used to do this way too when i was in pro tools like make the aux make the track that's going to receive it first and then go do the assigning into it um right. so it's a super valid way of course you can do you know roll however you, however you like but uh you know this is you're doing step 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 to be able to create the assignments when uh you know you can easily you can easily select them all command shift uh command shift b create a new bus name it boom 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 uh so yeah there's fast fastish and then you know the step-by-step -step way whichever one you prefer they all get you to the same destination which is having sense or output buses available yeah exactly nice um and then you know so as long as we're talking about buses you know we, we touched on it real quick there you know you have uh, summing is available as you're creating the buses, so you can specify Neve or API summing. Uh, the other thing that's unique in Luna to buses besides the summing option is the ATR master tape um, right. function, which you can, uh, you know, and Drew, I saw a comment earlier, someone was asking, like, why don't you have ATR on all of your buses? Because uh, ATR, it imparts a lot of sound on those buses, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a, but, you know, ATR is definitely on my master fader and everything. And occasionally I put it on a drum sub, but it's certainly not a default global thing that I wouldn't consider it. Uh, it's just, yeah, like you said, it's a lot of coloration. Um, and it, it certainly wouldn't, in this particular case, if, if I were to hit play, you'd hit, this is a bit, this is a big, uh, this track's got a pretty big bottom on it already. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, master tape on all of them would probably be overkill. So nice. Uh, got, uh, B world's asking in here, you know, my fader scale is different between tracks and buses. Like the zero is literally moving around. Uh, it, don't worry. Don't panic. That's completely on purpose. <laughs> That's part of the, the summing emulation. Uh, right. so yeah. So Matt, like if you, if you throw on new summing, you guys will notice that the, the meter scale on that track just changed. It goes from the standard Luna one to, uh, to a Neve taper. Um, and so that yeah, moves you can see the, comparing it to the track next to it. The, the taper is a little bit different now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, yeah. It's the, the fader, fader taper itself. Yep. Mm -hmm. Can you throw the API on the next bus too? So we can see all three side by side. Ooh. There we go. Yeah. And so now knows, knows when he went to API, the zero point is even lower. And again, this is emulating how these faders wore in the real world, like the spacing of them and where that zero was on the fader taper. But you're gonna notice all those audio tracks that are feeding into the sub. They're now, you know, they're going through that API summing. The taper for all those tracks came down as well. Um, again, because right. the, they're now going into a, an API summing mixer. And those faders, those consoles would top out at plus ten on the fader travel, mm -hmm. as opposed to the Neve, which went up to plus twelve. So that's what that's what accounts for. It's just a visual thing. It's not actually changing the volume. It's just a visual depiction of where the fader would be if you were actually on that console. Yeah. yeah, at first glance, you can think, oh, is the drum sub actually lower than the yeah. other two? But they're all at zero. Just got to yep. pay attention to the fader. Yeah, it's, it's just a visual thing for the, how that would have felt. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, uh, yeah, ATR is a great tone option. Uh, and yeah, so guys, with the, with the ATR, it's a great thing. You know, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to recreate a classic studio workflow, your ATR would, you'd have just one of those machines in the room unless you, uh, you know, it was super fancy, super uh, in a crazy studio. You'd have one on your main fader. That's like your final print machine where you're, you're sending your whole mix into. Uh, but now that all of us, myself included, are getting spoiled by Luna, sometimes I'll do it like on the drum subgroup or I'll do it on a guitar subgroup. And there it's much more of like a tone shaper. Uh, yeah. The built-in EQ, the little bit of saturation, the, the, the tone that you're getting out of the ATR, uh, being able to throw those on some subgroups and use it for a little subtle compression, a little subtle EQ, <laughs> Um, and you know, you get the benefits of kind of traveling through some extra tape. Uh, it's a, it's a really powerful tool to have and be able to put it on multiple buses is, is a real luxury. Yeah. And, yeah, uh, and definitely. Ben For For Forrest on Facebook had a question that is near and dear to my heart. He's mm -hmm. asking, 
what are the advantages, disadvantages of routing an effect to an instrument or vocal bus as opposed to putting it directly on the track? And this, uh, th if you want to share, if you want to switch yeah. over to my screen, I can give you a quick little, mm -hmm. have a quick little discussion about that because this is something that I th see a lot of people, a lot of people doing where they'll put reverb, like when it comes to time-based effects, things like reverb and delay and so forth, it's, it's, you just, you really don't want to put them directly onto tracks. It, it, it's rare when you want to do that. And uh, there's some really good reasons. First and foremost is the fact that if you have a mono track, um, when you when you go to put the effect on it, so if I just make a mono track, um, the moment I go and put uh, capital chambers, for example, on this on this, I've now just cr monified that reverb, mm -hmm. um, which is which is not great. Uh, you know, it, it's part of the beauty of this is that you'd lose all that width and dimensionality. Um, so that's that's version number that's reason number one why you wouldn't want to do it. But the really big thing is is that uh, people are a, a lot of people don't understand that a uh, that a mix control, a mix control is not an amount knob. It's an inverse or reciprocal level control between the dry and the wet. In other words, when I put the mix to 100 percent, it's nothing but reverb. And as I drop that down, what's happening simultaneously, the reverb is coming down and the dry signal is coming up. And mm -hmm. when I if I when I go back towards 100 percent, the reverb's coming up, but the dry signal's coming down. Yeah. So when when you adjust this balance control, you're literally you then have to you then have to readjust your fader every single time. Anytime you adjust this, I now need to compensate with that. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a really bad thing to do because it just kind of sets off your things out of balance quite a lot. And then of course the 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 other side of that is is the moment you now want to add reverb to a, to the track next to it you're having to copy, copy that reverb. So I, yeah, I, I get sessions from people sometimes and there's like nine of the same reverbs inserted onto a, uh, onto a track. And, uh, people are thinking, you know, it's great for the computer industry. People buy new computers thinking they need, uh, you know, <laughs> thinking that they need a new computer, but meantime, <laughs> yeah. they're just running nine versions of the same thing. Totally. So, anyway, hopefully uh, that helps for us. Totally. Yeah, man, you guys, uh, today, question the comments and the questions are coming in uh really really great and you guys are almost reading our minds here uh, i had a good question uh come in here asking about you know so there's only with only eight cents uh they're asking you know first of all why uh, i believe the answer to the why is because most people not too many people uh, require more than eight but in the rare case as you pointed out uh i think it was collins was uh was talking about this rare times you actually need more than eight cents uh, you can create a multiple output, and that, you're, that was literally next on our outline here, uh, Colin. So you're, you're you're reading my notes or something, but let me show you guys. <laughs> this is this is now we're getting we've now covered the basics: groups, buses, sends, how to share effects, how to route them, how to create them. Uh, so I think we're all operating the same baseline. Again, if uh, anything you guys are feel like we're missing, uh, let us know in the chat. Uh, I saw some questions about soloing buses. We're going to get to that here in a second. Um, but talking about you know running you know not just for the fact that you have only eight cents but there's also a really cool trick that i want to show you guys um around uh around creating multi-output buses so this is something that's, that's really cool really powerful and there's a lot of great uses for this um so let's say you know i've got my my vocal uh my lead vocal track selected here so over here on the left hand side i come into sends you know so i can hit the plus button and you know i'm gonna do it the clicky way uh lead vocal process leave it stereo none you know this is just for demonstration great now i've made one now what i can do oops why did that not there we go so now my vocal hook is being sent out to my lead vocal process i can control the level going into that with this little knob here something that's really cool about luna is i can also in this window over here, if I hold the command key, I can select multiple buses. So now that this one send fader, you'll notice, let me zoom in, it now says multiple, right? And so it is being sent to lead vocal process, the new one I created, but it's also going to the room, the plate, and the delay, all with one knob. Um, this was, uh, you know, it's funny, man. Uh, the first person that showed me doing this and made the biggest use out of it was uh, it's very is like the first week or two of, of Luna being out. We had a session with uh, Vance Powell and Dave Cobb, 
Vance was using this trick to do multiple parallel processes on his drums. So he was he had assigned the output of his drums, you know, his kick and snare, they'd be going to the main drum subgroup, but they'd also be going to multiple parallel tracks as well. And he used this multi-routing trick. Um, it works on sends, it works on outputs, but it allows you to send uh, send audio into multiple buses with a single control, which is really, really cool. Really, There's a lot of great ways to make use out of this. Um, you know, for instance, like this, like, you know, my vocal processing, I just want to send uh you know send a bunch of level into all of these at the same time um and i've done this a lot of times in mixes where you know i'll send kind of a unity level send you know i'll even sometimes on a lead vocal i'll put this right at zero sending into my effects and then obviously you're going to get back a lot of reverb a lot of delay you're gonna be like whoa that's a lot but then what i'll do is i'll come down i'll come down lower into my track here let me switch over to the mixer so you guys can see these and what I'll do is I'll come in here and I'll trim down those tracks. So this way I can send I can send my level into, and I know that, especially as I'm building that rough mix, if I have that send parked at like either zero dB or minus six, you know, somewhere in that upper range, um, then I you know I come over here and then I trim these these faders down to get the the appropriate balance. But what it does is it gives me a much better resolution on my send fader. Because otherwise, a lot of times, I would, at least personally, what I would do, what I'd find myself doing is, you know, I'd have my send at like minus 20 or minus 30. You know, you'd be down in like the lower edges of that fate of that region. Um, so you're constantly, you know, you're constantly dealing with your fader or your knob at a lower resolution. But by bringing that up at zero when you're building the rough, going over to your return bus where the effects are parked, um, bringing that down, now you can send into it with a little bit more level. Um, which again, you know, when you're when you're operating with these emulations, that means you're also you know say something like the the Lexicon 480L. I'm now hitting I'm I'm hitting the input circuit of that a little bit harder, a little bit you know I'm getting in there with some level with some actual and all of these uh, effects boxes they all respond to that, especially stuff like the Korg SDD, uh, the Lexicon 224. They have it's not just about the reverb. It's not just about the signal processing. It's also about that input and output gain staging and the processing that they would do to those. Um, so this is it's a great trick to get a little bit better resolution, still get the balance that you want, um, and of course then you know you can use that trick that I showed of of assigning you know a single a single vocal track to multiple sends here, and now controlling all of those effects with one, and then going further down in my session and balancing those out. Um, is that making sense to, to folks? Yeah, I think so. Think yeah, so. totally. Awesome. Uh, so that's, that's how you do multiple outputs. Um, and then, oh, the other, the other one I saw really early on that we wanted to touch on mm -hmm. is mono to stereo buses. Um, so, you know, some of you folks are, say, uh, the example I saw earlier in the, in the questions was asking about, you know, if I've got a clean guitar DI that's mono, how do I make that a stereo? How do I process that in stereo? How do I get you know a stereo guitar amp happening? Um, and similarly, you may want to do this for like vocal effects, right? To be able to have like a either something that's panning or a ping pong delay, etc. Um, so this is uh, this is actually fairly fairly easy process. And again, I'll demonstrate this with uh, with this vocal. Let me just so I got my lead vocal going to that lead vocal process bus that I made earlier. So this is a, you can check out the, the meters here. So we got a mono track going into a stereo bus. Uh, you can tell by the, the number of lines here in the meters that you know, one is stereo, one's mono. So what's going to happen now is this, this mono track is now being sent over here into stereo. This is probably what the, you know, one thing, if I were to put a stereo plugin on here, um, and just to really illustrate this, uh, I'm going to use... Uh, yeah, you know, something like the the cyclonic panner. Uh, this is an <laughs> auto pan plugin. It, by the way, if you guys haven't messed with this plugin yet, uh, I, I thought you, you said psychotic panner. Yeah. That's what I heard. Psychotic oh, yeah. panner. also kind of true. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, also true. Yeah, you know, I don't don't read so good this early in the morning. It is the <laughs> cyclosonic panner, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, so this one's this one's it's a really rad plugin, guys. If you haven't, it it as you notice, it's got spinning lights. Uh, it makes things spin in a really cool way. Um, I've got I've made a bunch of presets for myself on this one uh to move hat you know hi hat tracks around um you know just kind of make them dance with the music a little bit but regardless since this is on a mono track 
it is not going to do deadly squat. It's going to sound, it's just going to kind of be phasey and weird up and down because it's collapsing a stereo process into mono. However, if I remove that there, come over here to my stereo, uh, to my stereo, stereo lead vocal process track bus that I made. Sorry. Uh, now this audio is being passed into this panner. So this would be happening in parallel, which is, may or may not be what you're looking for. Uh, you know, when you're doing like a, a ping pong delay, you would do it in this sense, but let's say, you know, in this case I want in just like with the, uh, you know, I want to create wanting to create a stereo guitar from a mono guitar track. What you would want to do is you'd want to come down here to the output and say, you know what? I want to take my mono output of this track, feed it into my stereo bus lead vocal process. And now that vocal, you know, I can process it in mono on its original track. So I can have my SSL channel, you know, doing its work on the vocal, the auto tune, and then go into this bus to now become stereo and dance all over the stereo field using the uh, cyclosonic panner or using a yeah, another delay. Yeah, and Ben, if you wanted, rather than doing it from the output, you could use a pre-fader send, and then therefore, then you could automate. Sometimes, first part of the track, you want it mono, and then you could automate to switch over to the stereo version. Mm -hmm. If you did it on a pre-fader send, that would work as well. Drew, great point, man. Something that we totally, uh, something that we totally skipped over here, which is uh, sends. Let me let me set it up just how, how Drew mentioned. Uh, you guys will notice that you know, so both when you have it open or closed, doesn't matter. There's the the knob, the the fader, the level control that you know we've been using rocking so far. There's two buttons next to it that are very very important to know. Uh, M is mute, allows you to quickly mute ascend, uh, but the one next to it is P. Um, and so yeah, we maybe should have talked about this up in the basics area, but essentially yeah, what probably, yeah. what P does, this makes it a pre fader send. So if this is not enabled. The amount of level that is being sent to that bus depends on where this fader is at, at the bottom of my session. So if this is all the way down, no signal is getting sent to that bus. As I bring it up, more and more signal is getting sent. So it's basically, you know, whatever whatever this level is, plus or minus whatever level this is, is what's now feeding into your bus. For me, ninety, I'd say ninety five percent of the time. I leave it this way, po quote unquote, yep. post fader yeah. send. So this is yeah. that's why it's the default. This most of the time, this is the way you're going to want to handle it. But let's say let's say you know I wanted to be able to switch between my mono, let's just how Drew said it, between the mono version of this track and then like a weird affected one or a panning one or you know a filtered one, something. If you want to switch from one to another and use the sends like this, when you put this in pre fader mode. This send ignores this fader. It 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 takes the signal from before that fader happens. So now, the level into this bus only depends on this fader. So it still has the inserts. It still you know it still gets this processing. But then from there, it's now sent to the bus before it hits my pan and fader down here. Uh, so this allows me to you know ensure that there's always signal being sent into the bus, which is great for parallel processing um, or for, you know, special effects where you're going to mute, you know, you're going to automate the, 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 the clean, the dry fader and, and bring the wet up. Um, what are some other uses for pre fader sends uh, that you guys know of? Well, like maybe, you know, for some special effects, like let's say it's the end of the track and you kind of want the vocal to go out into a reverb so you could automate down the dry signal while allowing the send to persist, mm -hmm. thereby, you know, letting that vocal sort of die into the reverb or, um, but there's, you know, only a, f maybe only a few. Um, mm -hmm. Totally. That's so what I do, you know. Yeah. How about you, Matt? Do you ever use pre-fader stuff for stuff? Um, pretty much exactly what Drew said. If I want to hear only the effect, but be able to either pull down the fader or mute the track completely and still have it send to that effect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's uh, you're going to run into scenarios where, where you want this, but this is also going to factor into uh, it's one of the other topics that we wanted to touch on with, it, which is I believe uh, soloing. <laughs> so talking about, uh, yeah. we saw some questions in the chat already asking about this. Um, so typically, you know, broadly. Hitting solo on a track 
and Luna automatically solos the buses that it's being sent to, right? So if, uh, say in Drew's example, if you solo the, the drum, you know, a kick drum, it autom Luna automatically knows, oh, I got to I gotta also let the, the drum sub group and uh, any of the reverbs that are a part of that track, those all automatically get soloed. Um, yeah. And I guess we yeah, are probably easiest to just see this in real time. So Drew, let me, uh, let me show you your screen here. So we can walk people through the, the different scenarios. So, and again, we don't want to make this sound like it's complicated because it's often very easy, yeah. but there's a couple exceptions and a few things I, I think you guys are running into at home, uh, where you, you're soloing a bus or you're soloing a track and you're not necessarily getting what you thought you should be getting, uh, played back. Yeah, and I can I can demonstrate that, but let's start with the let's start with the basics because this is really like this is where Luna excels at, at keeping things really smart, fast, intuitive. For example, with my drums, I have as we mentioned earlier, I have a reverb, a time based effect send and return here, but I also have a parallel process. And of course, when I go to solo just my kick drum, then what Luna will do is Luna knows that that this kick drum feeds a drum subgroup that and it also includes these two bus sends so it intelligently allows me to solo forward so i'm gonna hit play and you can see that my reverb and my parallel process and my ultimate output which is the drum subgroup are all i'm able to hear them as i as as you would expect and as you would like now so that's from the tracks forward. Now, if I if I were to move if I were to move over to uh, a, a bus, let's let's solo the just the drum reverb, and there you can and hear again, the, you can when, hear the snare in there, right? Just so, yeah, it's a, so now it's a reverb. Exactly. So I'm hearing basically when you solo a bus, you're soloing the entirety of that bus. So whatever happens to be sending to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, same with the parallel process here. So this is allowing me to hear my my rev a parallel process and then of course if i solo the ultimate uh you know if i solo the drum subgroup i get it all right again the parallel so, and the reverb but the thing that you get yeah the thing that was missing is right when you solo the parallel you didn't hear the reverb anymore exactly yeah because these are there's there's separate buses from each other they don't they don't actually you know they don't uh intermingle with each other in any way so yeah you would not hear the uh parallel so basically what it boils down to is when you're soloing tracks you're soloing from the track forward through any buses to the main out mm -hmm. and when you're soloing a bus you're soloing anything sent to that bus right yep so the slightly you know what could be a weird situation here is let's say for example i were to solo my reverb and I'm expecting to do that. But if I happen to also be sending, I don't know, from, um, let's send from uh, over here, the mm -hmm. bass synth, which actually I would need to do this one, I think. Uh, this, so this, if you've ever had this situation where you go to solo a reverb that is, that is maybe you're using primarily on drums, but another track happens to be sending to it, in this you're case, you're going to get bass that track. Synth, you're going to get that track, right. Mm -hmm. So that's the, you know, if that's a slightly, uh, you know, maybe slightly counterintuitive thing to it, but ultimately in 90 per plus percent of the cases, you're just going to get what you need and what you, and what you want. Um, now the one thing, so I guess, I guess we should talk about solo safe, right? Yep. Yeah. So, I was just about to ask you. So there is this, and by the way, you get to this by right clicking on the yeah. solo button. Um, yeah. Right clicking on a solo button. So what these are for, what, what solo safing is for, solo safing is for when you need a bus to not be muted when soloing another bus. So mm -hmm. let's just say, let, let me come up with an example for this. So let's say I were, I were going to be sending um, uh, to, let's just say, well, let me just make a new thing. Um, I'm going to make a new bus from send one from this selected track. And so let's say I wanted to add reverb because I see I see this happening quite a lot. I was let's like, this, I is, this, is the reverb. Most, this is the most common scenario for for why yeah. you would want to use solo say and even uh, Bjorn's asking like this is exactly what I think a lot of people are running into is when you you know send into a subgroup, send into a bus, and then you want to send that bus to a reverb or to you know some other buses. This is the this is the most important element to know of how solos are gonna work. Yeah. So this is what, yeah, this is what, so this winds up happening. What's happening now is I am putting the send on a bus to another bus. So now when I hit, let's say, for example, when I solo my drums, let's solo my drums and we're going to hear 
Right. Obviously, I'm soloing the original track, so Luna knows to solo forward through those tracks. However, if I then go to solo the drum subgroup itself, where'd my reverb go? Well, uh -huh. so this is where solo safe comes into play. If I right click solo safe now. So basically, Luna is solo safing intelligently for you most of the time, but when it comes to sending from one bus to another bus, that's where solo isolate comes in mm -hmm. um, to play. Well, an important thing to know is like, as you're solo safing stuff like this, now, Drew, if you were to unsolo your drum sub and say solo your congas, you're gonna, you, if, if signal is traveling through that drum sub while you're doing a solo, you're gonna get, you're gonna hear that reverb happening. Well, in this case, in this case if I solo tracks, I won't, but if yep. I solo a, bu a bus, I will. Well, actually, no, I won't. Yeah. So it's it's a uh, yeah. In this case, if I solo this sub, it's going to it's going to mute all of the other tracks that are feeding to it. So it's only nice. when you solo a bus that includes other tracks being sent to it would mm -hmm. that happen. So I can do either one. Nice. So yeah, most of the time, most of the time, Luna's working with you guys. Like the the yeah. goal here is that it's over. It's kind of it's being as intelligent as uh, as a dog can get around the solo logic of like knowing. All right, you're soloing this track. You probably want to hear all the buses it's feeding into. Oh, you're soloing yeah. this bus. You probably want to hear the audio tracks that are feeding it. Plus, you know, plus its other friends, and then you know, the the solo safe just comes in when you find yourself in this scenario where you're not hearing what you need to hear because you're sending a bus to a bus. That's where so, you know that's the pretty much the the number one spot where you'd want to use solo safe. The other one that I personally use all the time for solo safe is uh, when I'm using analog summing when I have a return track coming off the yeah. summing uh, console or uh, or the analog summing that's coming back in. I want that to never, ever be affected by the solos. And that's essentially what solo safe means, guys, is it? It just means that no matter what's happening in the session, this track is always active. It's always, it's, it will never get muted by some other solo um, is essentially how it's working. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, one other thing, I guess, that maybe we would, should we, have we gone, should we cover spill? Yeah, dude, we, we, is that, we, this is, is a great time? time. This is a good time to. This is a this is a feature. If you guys have been watching Office Hours for a while, hopefully you've seen us touch on this feature before. But if not, this is this is such a cool, uh, kind of somewhat unique to to Luna, uh, but such a powerful thing for mixing. Mm -hmm. Spill button. So what? Yeah. Talk us through this. How does this work, Drew? So yeah, so the spill feature is. I find this. This is like to me. This is really revolutionary for mixing, and it's kind of it. It it ties in with everything that that I've been showing in this demo today, as far as keeping things organized, neat, separated, uh, and, and color coded, and so forth. Um, because you know, basically, what spill allows you to do is you'll notice that all buses have a spill button, um, mm -hmm. and the, the the basic premise behind them is that if I if I if I hit the spill button on a bus it will show me only the tracks that are feeding that bus plus my main out. So it's a really handy way of being able to simply clean up your screen very quickly to only show the tracks that are that are contributors to that given bus. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's its, that's its basic feature. Um, and it's super handy. It's, it's mostly a visual clutter thing, but it just allows you to focus on those tracks. But for me, it, it dovetails into the entire way I like to work, which is... Um, and you'll notice that the main output also has a spill button. And that's what I'm going to focus on because this is really how I love to work uh, in Luna. As you'll notice that I've got a lot of tracks going on here and this is a pretty small session, but they, you know, they can get, they can get huge. Right. Mm -hmm. So it, sometimes it's a little unwieldy and you only, you know, only want to see so much. So the way I like, I, you'll notice that all of my, all of my groups, all of my tracks are grouped, color coded. They have their own separated effects and they're all feeding buses. So if you set your session up this way, you set yourself up for a really cool workflow. And, and so here, here's how it goes. Um, first of all, you can spill the main fader. So if I hit spill on the main fader, instantly I now am, I am now presented with only my sub mixes, right? So this is a great way to just sort of work when the mix is pretty far along and you're just doing little you know, automation rides and so forth. But what's super cool is that I can then dive in from here. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm gonna show you two, I'm gonna show you two different ways to do this. The first way is to simply click spill on the drum subgroup and you'll notice that I m immediately dive into the into the drums and then when I unspill I go all the way back out mm -hmm. so that's 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 one way to work what a uh, 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 the way I like to work is I actually hold down command and what command does is I'll command spill the drums 
Um, and then when I, that way it shows me, it adds that to them. So now mm-hmm. I'm seeing my subgroups plus my drums. And then if I command spill back out, then I get right back to where I started. So nice. it, by, by being in this mode, I'm able to work with my, my, just my buses. And then I can, at any point I can command spill in to, to add in those, the congas command spill back out. And if, if I want to see the whole thing, I simply spill back out from there. So having your session structured like this, whereby you can, you know, I, you, you can see all of your green buses and you can dive in and dive back out as needed. So that's a spill is really a, you know, a way of managing. I mean, literally you could dozens or hundreds of tracks and you could really get it down to a, condense it down into a really fast way to navigate. Yeah. On well, a relate on a related note, you can also command if you hold down command back to the groups feature. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I might have mentioned this already. Command clicking on this shows you only those. Yeah. Um, and command yeah. Cl- yeah, I think I already showed that. So. Well, and, yeah. And so I'll, that's that's spill. And I'll add I'll add to the the spill thing, especially for those of us uh, if you've got dual monitors. Uh, there's a, another way to kind of extend how this works, which is uh, to come up here to window. And do new alternate window. Uh, there's a shortcut, Command Shift equals. So when you in Luna, when you build, oops, one second, it's on my it defaulted to my other screen. Uh, let me bring this <laughs> down for you guys to see. Uh, so here is here's my alternate window. And now, uh, now when I hit, what I can do is essentially what I do. I leave this up on my. I've got a big screen up here, and you can already see this one set up. Um, so this is a, it's basically a mixer minus. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll leave a second window here in spill mode on the main. So it's, it's all, uh, you know, it's just all my subgroups. It's all my returns. It's all the stuff that I'm going to want to make minor adjustments to. And then I've got a second window. That's my full mixer. So I'll leave the full mixer down on my main screen here. My like sub mixer kind of looking at the mains and the returns up there. And then, you know, whether it's for soloing or making little adjustments as I go, uh, it makes a makes it a very easy process. So if you're using dual monitors, uh, make sure you guys are, are aware of this new alternate window. And one of the other things I love about the new alternate window workflow in Luna is it saves with the session. You know, so as soon as I pulled up that alternate window, it automatically recalled the stuff I had up on there when I was working on this mix. Nice. Yeah, that's nice. Mm hmm. Um, so yeah, that's another, another little, little handy trick for using spill for using alternate windows. Um, so now let's, let's, let's talk about, we're, we're getting through it. We're almost, we're almost wrapped up here, guys. So if you guys, if there's any questions that you guys feel that we haven't gotten to, make sure to drop them in the chat. Uh, cause we got a couple, two last, like, very important things around buses and we already had some questions around it earlier. One's asking about arm. Um, so advanced real time monitoring. Uh, you know, first of all, there, we did a whole drew walked, did a whole deep dive with us last year where we talked all about arm for tracking for overdubbing. Um, and you guys will have, have no doubt noticed as we're <coughs> talking about all these buses, there's a little arm button. You'll notice that a couple of them are orange and a lot of them are grayed out. Um, so, you know, with arm buses, they're, they're kind of, they're a special bus. Uh, and that you, they allow you to monitor those buses in real time. Uh, and I believe Matt, correct me if I'm wrong. This, this works both when they are, does it work when they're as an output or does it only work when they're send, um, configured? Only when they're, uh, the send. So when you take like a normal track and put it into arm mode, it basically ignores whatever the output on the track is. It just goes straight out to the monitor left and right outputs. Mm -hmm. Um, whatever sends you have on that track are still active. So yeah, you would, you could send, uh, from the send section to an arm enabled bus and still be able to hear that while the track is in arm mode. Gotcha. And so this is, you know, essentially what we're going to end up using these for, you know, the whole, we talked about a bunch in that show, but I'll reiterate it here. Arm is all about getting the signal from input to an output, whether it's a headphone cue or your speakers, the whole point of arm is to get that signal there as fast as possible. Like we want, we want as close to zero latency as possible when we're playing. Um, so that's why, you know, it removes AU plugins. It changes the output routing. It does a bunch of kind of magic things in the background to ensure that the signal is going from input to output as fast as, uh, human computerly possible, uh, as fast as your interface will support. Um, so that means that there's a limit to this. So with with uh, with auxes with buses, you're gonna have two, and you'll see it when you go in. Uh, when you go into your screen here, uh, you'll notice, like let's say I wanted, you know, say I was gonna record some vocals on this session. 
what I would want to do is I'd want to say, all right, my, my singer's about to sing. She's probably going to want some plate reverb and maybe a little bit of delay. So I'm going to come onto the arm track, right click on it, and assign it to aux one and assign my delay to aux two. So what these are doing is it's, it's in the background. It's actually controlling console. It's controlling, it's saying, hey, in console, hey, in those, uh, actually, this wouldn't work in this case because I have an AU plugin on there. Uh, let me, so let me do a room and a plate. So, hey, load up the, the 480L and the EMT140 with these Neve plugins right after it. It would load those chains into those reserved aux one and two slots. So now I can send those to, let me turn the cues back on. Um, I could send, I can now send her vocal along with, with those delays and reverbs to the cue mix. Again, all arriving to your ear with almost no latency. Um, and so you do have to be specific about this. And it, it typically, you know, as we've talked about this, uh, a few times before, you typically want to use this for time-based effects, right? You want to use it for reverbs, for delays. Uh, in theory, you can kind of use it for parallel compression or like dirt. You know, if you're going to really mess up a signal, and you want to add this. Like uh, Jakir, I think did this last year in our master class. Like he showed recording the vocals with a bunch of dirt with like some distortion, just some growls. Some th again to give the singer some inspiration, to give them some like, hey, here's how cool you could sound, and just tuck that in under their dry signal. Arm buses work great for that sort of stuff. Anything that's sw supposed to be kind of clean, there's you know a couple of samples of latency, so you may end up with like a weird comb filter thing if you just do it completely direct. Um, or you know, Ben, you could also do that uh, pre fader trick that you did earlier. Pre pre fader send mute the mute the channel, mm -hmm. the actual channel, and then you now you can send to that uh, arm enabled aux and only send that to the queue. So yeah, in that way you can track through. That's oh, also nice. how you can do. Yeah, and remember in the in the arm deep dive we showed how you can take a mono unison channel, bring it in mono, send it to an arm enabled aux, pre fader, mute it, and boom, you now have a stereo uh, arm enabled aux. So you could do, you know, I think we showed the Fender fifty five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for doing the like stereo that. guitar yeah, yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, so exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, Drew, you, you were dropping some links there in the chat uh, to go yeah, back and rewatch yeah. that arm deep dive. It's a long episode, but guys, if you're doing tracking, overdubbing, uh, producing anything where you that being staying in real time matters, uh, you you owe it to yourself to watch that show because we we talked about all facets of of the arm mode, all the different use cases, the different setups, uh, and it's it's a really comprehensive look at how this feature works. Uh, yeah, and, and shout out to Michael. Shout out to Michael Kilpatrick for timestamping that one and many other ones there. So, oh, nice. yeah, if you go to that, yeah, if you go to the arm deep dive in the comments, you can you can get to where you want to go using the timestamps that Michael did. Nice, nice. Um, so yeah, so arm. I think anything else about arm buses that uh, we didn't cover today? I guess you know, there's two. Well, of them. I guess the one thing, the mm -hmm. one thing was that you can make mono buses in Luna, but only but they can't be arm enabled, right? So mono yeah, buses right. are for mixing only. Uh, not tracking, which is a minor uh, mm -hmm. thing, but just throwing it out there. Um, uh, Bo's asking, can you have multiple plugins on an arm track and they'll all process? Uh, it depends. Sure. Uh, so <laughs> it, uh, it all <laughs> depends, Bo. So the uh, on a on any arm track, it, it Mac, it, there's a, there's a setting. There's two a couple of settings that matter here. So one is like by default, it has to at least fit on one chip of the shark. So. Uh, if you use like a heavy duty emulation, you know, like the 480 or capital chambers, that's going to eat up majority of the chip. It's going to be hard to fit another plug in uh, into that same chip to, again to stay real time. But then there's a, yeah. a, a special feature called DSP pairing that allows you to do multiple, you know, a little bit longer effects chains and heavier duty plugins. Um, I think you have a, there's a UAD basics video that dives into DSP pairing, correct? Yeah, exactly. It's called channel DSP pairing. Explains the the whole process of how it works. But basically, you're you're sacrificing uh, a pair of virtual channels to be able to use two DSP chips to process one uh, console channel. So in the context of the auxes, that would let you load up a chain of plugins on one aux that uses more than just one DSP chip. It could actually use two DSP chips. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you're using like the Fender 55 or something that uses most of one DSP chip, um, enabled channel DSP pairing, and you'll be able to get a few more plugins on that channel as well. Nice. Yeah, and that's a that's a setting that you guys can get to. Um, you know, if you come into in Luna, uh, click on the click on the diamond, come over here to settings, hardware, and right here, this channel DSP pairing. This is where you choose between how many virtual channels you want to have reserved and how many DSP pairs you want to have available. 
Um, so if you're if you're finding yourself, and this is why we made a setting that you could you know trade off between these two. Uh, if you find yourself you know oh, especially in a tracking situation, constantly kind of neve 1084 into a pull tech like if you're kind of building some heavy duty chains you may end up wanting more dsp pairs uh but if you're say you're doing more production more in the box where you find yourself using virtual instruments uh and you want to keep those in arm mode all the time you're going to want more virtual channels available um so this is a setting that you can adjust again that's in your uh in your settings on the hardware tab uh that's where you'll find that and it's per device and it's saved with the device uh, so that it, if you go from session to session, these settings won't recall with the session. They recall with your devices, which is important to know. And then I saw another uh, great question come in here. Um, Damon was, Damon's asking, when he listens to a track, he can hear the stereo panning, but in the queue, it was, he wasn't getting stereo. He wasn't getting the same panning in the queue. Um, mm. And this highlights a, a, <laughs> something we were, we were just kind of talking about a little bit for the sense. Is you get, you'll notice by default, cues are pre-fader. Uh, I believe this is default. I don't think I would have changed it in this session. Um, yeah, so cues, they default to pre-fader, yeah. They default to pre-fader. So this means yeah. no matter what I move this fader to, it doesn't go to the, the – if I send the cue here, it's not listening to what's happening down here, both for the panning and the, and the metering. Uh, sorry, the panning and the level. Uh, so what you're going to want to do uh, specifically, when you want to pan your cue – you're going to want to come over here and you know open up uh, to open this up. You can either click on the little uh, rectangle in the middle of the queue send, and that, that opens this up, or over here on the left hand side, this expands it from a knob into a fader. Then here's where you can you can copy over uh, panning into your queue. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, this does this work for um, oh, right when you do copy the to queue send itself. Yeah, mm -hmm. right click on the queue itself. So check this out, guys. We've we've yeah. demonstrated this once or twice, but if you right click on uh, on your faders, you get copy mix two, and that cop you can copy to Q one or Q two. Notice when I hit Q one, all my pre all my pre fader Q sends now the levels match my main mixer, but also all the panning automatically carried over as well. Uh, so this can be a great shortcut for quickly getting stuff moving stuff up into the queues. Uh, and then, so that's right click on the fader. When you right click on the send, you can see there's a copy mix to send one through. So you can do the same sort of thing if you're using sends. Uh, right click here on my pan knob, copy mix to send one. Notice it's going to update that, uh, my send level here into my plate as well. Um, so those are two, you know, it's a little right click uh, tricky feature to be able to quickly move your mix from uh, from your big faders up to your smaller faders. Nice. Uh, cool, we got the links to the DSP pairing video. Nice, good work, guys. You guys are so on top of it. Um, I can't cut and paste today. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, pasted the arm, I pasted the arm video like three times accidentally. Sorry. Yeah. Well, and so I guess the, the last last thing that we had on our list to, to talk about, and this, this relates to the arm mode and to kind of managing all these levels, uh, we wanted to quickly touch on gain staging for you guys as well. So, uh, you know, if you find yourself in that scenario where you've, you know, you've been mixing, say you're kind of like halfway done mixing, uh, and now the vocalist wants to replace their vocal, as Matt, as Matt mentioned, when you record enable that track, it no longer goes through the buses as it was. So it'll skip any subgroups. It'll skip the the tape. Uh, it'll kind of disable the things again, so the signal can get to uh, the singer's ears as fast as possible. A big thing to know, though, that sometimes people what they'll end up doing right is you'll have your your lead vocal and it's going into a bus, and you've got that say like a background vocal. You've pulled that bus fader down. That subgroup is down, say like 10, 12 dB. So it's tucked in underneath the lead vocal track. Now, when you record enable one of those background vocal tracks to to record into it, it's not going through that minus 10 dB fader anymore. It's going to be back up at just at whatever fader that whatever value the uh, track fader is at. Uh, so something to keep in mind that if it got something kind of quiet and you record enable it, it may jump up in volume a lot. Uh, and you know, that's not just, is that, I can't remember when you're doing a punch in, does it still go through the bus before it goes out to the ears or does it, when you're, no, when you're always, about to punch in, yeah. it always goes, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's cause it's, what's happening is arm mode is merging disc playback and live audio through the same output. Uh, to mm -hmm. the cues, so it would yeah it would take that volume level 
both for the playback audio and for the live audio. Yeah. So it's, it's, that's kind of in my, in my book, that's been the only real scenario where I've run into that issue of like, Oh crap, too much. Why is this background vocal all of a sudden 10 dB louder? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, this can have, I guess with like guitars, if you're using buses to do processing stuff like that. Um, so it's something to be aware of just where your track and your bus fader relationship is specifically if you're going to go back and overdub onto that record track and a great workaround uh, you'll see myself and a lot of other uh, engineers and producers do is when they're going to go do an overdub like that instead of overdubbing onto the track that they're already working on that they're already mixing into and they've got assigned out into these buses and uh Often what kind of works better, guys, is to make a new track specifically for your overdub. Uh, so that way you can you can keep the takes together. You know, if you're going to use versions, you're going to kind of playlist uh, different takes of it. You've got a new track to represent, hey, the new bridge that the singer wanted to fly, you know, wanted to sing over again. Make a new track, record onto that track. And then once you get the take you like, you can copy that down onto your main vocal track and use that, you know, share the processing that you've already formulated. Um, but it, it kind of gets you out of this weird, like all of a sudden, why is my track so loud? Why is it so quiet? Those sorts of scenarios. Um, yeah. Well, another tip you could do, Ben is number one, if the track already has some automation on it, simply turn off the automation, yank the fader down 10 DB and then record enable it and do your thing. Or if it mm -hmm. doesn't have automation and you want to store the position, you could just double click to put a breakpoint there to mark where it used to be and yep. then turn off the automation and yank it down. And then when you're done, it'll jump back to where you had it. So there's ah, a couple, a little tip. tip there if you want to keep it on the same track. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nice. I do that myself. Yeah. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. I, I like, I love, you know, we've, we've, I've seen this in a lot of different workflows where they use the one vocal record track and then constantly copying it down to the sub track, you know, to the background tracks and whatnot. Uh, it can be a really fast flow for, uh, uh, when you're doing vocals, especially like, you know, being able to just put, keep the same auto tune setting on one track and then keep on copying them down as you're stacking up vocals can be, um, I think, uh, guru and cruise did that a lot when we did their vocal recording session. Uh, they'd have the yeah. one, the one active track and then they'd be copying things down as they got the take they wanted. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, Tommy's asking, is there a function similar to clip gain line for vocal rides? Uh, so yeah, Tommy, at the moment, the clip gain is per clip. So you could separate the clips and, and go in and uh, do clip gain uh, per clip. Uh, but there's not a clip gain line to do it like a vocal automation yet. Um, Although you could use, you can't uh, track uh, trim. Trim track uh, in the utility row is automatable and that's pre-inserts. So if you're looking for a way of being able to do vocal rides that are in front of your processing, mm -hmm. then the trim level in the utility row is what you'd want to do there. And yep. uh, just so you know, we're, we got a, you know, we have an automation show in the works, so which will include that as a part of that. So definitely stay tuned for for that in the future. We got we're, we got a good automation show cooking up. Yeah, we do. Oh yeah, way to get way to. That's actually it's on our doc for next week. So great, how is it? Okay, wow, great, great question. What a timely question. You guys are literally we're all we're all super in sync over here. Uh, Guys, you, you're reading our minds. Next week, our show is all about automation. Uh, there's a ton. Of, we've had a ton of questions about it. Uh, there's a lot of really cool advanced automation features that we haven't gotten to highlight before in the show. Um, so yeah, we're gonna. And there's you know we've people have asked about the golden faders. We're gonna show you how to get the golden faders and use them and put them really to work. And Drew's actually got an example with that that we haven't uh, highlighted ever on the show before. So next week is uh, just we're gonna deep dive into automation. Uh, so come prepare with all of your automation questions and, uh, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, I did see a couple of, a couple of unre slightly unrelated questions. People are asking about iLocks and, and what to do about iLock outages. Um, so I know, I guess this weekend there for a while, like the iLock cloud was down. Uh, one of the biggest suggestions, guys, if uptime and, and that sort of stuff really matters, get the iLock, the key. Get the a physical key because you can take your Luna license by default. Uh, they load into the iLock cloud, so you can just you know launch Luna and, and go. Um, but if you put it on the iLock key, it no longer has to hit the servers to be able to activate. You should be able to just authorize and launch Luna because you've got the authorizations there on your dongle. 
Um, yeah, and in that case, you want to hit the skip button. So when if you you go to launch Luna, and if there's an outage, it'll look like you can't sign in. And there's a little skip button there. If you mm -hmm. hit the skip button and let it sit for a minute, it'll it should time out on the cloud and then see the eye lock on the USB and load from there. That that's what happened to me on Saturday. So. Yeah. 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 Nice. Uh, yeah. Anything? Anything else? That, uh, any questions you guys saw that we should get to before we sign off for today? I don't know. I think we hit everything. Yeah, I think we hit them all. Nice. Well, guys, yeah. this, it's been uh, this was really cool. This was uh, we, like I said, we had a lot of people asking about how to distinguish buses from groups, how to how to make the best most use out of buses. So hopefully, uh, hopefully this was all you know helpful for you guys at home. I know we we kind of we interspersed some little little nuggets there, some really good tips that uh, you may not have seen before in the terms of creating buses, assigning them, making the best use out of them um so yeah this is it's really fun for us to put these shows together for you guys and yeah like i said next week we'll talk about automation we've also got another uh deep dive with drew uh the drew drew deep dive we're gonna we gotta brand the, the plugin plugin tip of the week uh we're gonna we're gonna talk about highlight some uh some channel strip plugins that you guys have been asking about seeing as well um so yeah guys really uh really fun hanging out with you all again uh have a great week go out make some fun music and uh, we'll see you guys back here next Monday. See you next week. Bye, everybody. See you guys.